And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with the beasts of the earth. Book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 8. There have been many related sequential coincidences all throughout my life, incidents that by themselves would have led nowhere. Statistically, the odds against the same are a related sequence of events happening to one individual are astronomically high. It is this series of incidents that have convinced me that God has had a hand in my life. I do not believe in fate. I do not believe in accidents. I cannot and will not accept the theory that long sequences of unrelated accidents determine world events. It is inconceivable that those with power and wealth would not band together with a common bond, a common interest, and a long-range plan to decide and direct the future of the world. For those with the resources to do otherwise would be totally irresponsible. I know that I would be the first to organize a conspiracy to control the outcome of the future if I were such a person and a conspiracy did not yet exist. I would do it in an attempt to ensure the survival of the principles in which I believe, the survival of my family, my survival, and the survival of the human race, if for no other reason. I believe, therefore, that a grand game of chess is being played on a level that we can barely imagine, and we are the pawns. Pawns are valuable only under certain circumstances, and are frequently sacrificed to gain an advantage. Anyone who has studied military strategy is familiar with the concept of sacrifice. Those who have seriously studied history have probably discovered the real reason we go to war on a regularly scheduled basis. My research has shown, at this point, that the future laid out for us may be just about impossible to change. I do not agree with the means by which the powerful few have chosen for us to reach the end. I do not agree that the end is where we should end at all. But unless we can wake the people from their sleep, nothing short of civil war will stop the planned outcome. I base that statement not on defeatism, but on the apathy of the majority of the American people. Twenty-five years ago, I would have believed otherwise. But twenty-five years ago, I was also sound asleep. We have been taught lies. Reality is not at all what we perceive it to be. We cannot survive any longer by hanging on to the falsehoods of the past. Reality must be discerned at all costs if we are to be a part of the future. Truth must prevail in all instances, no matter who it hurts or helps, if we are to continue to live upon this earth. At this point, what we want may no longer matter. It is what we must do to ensure our survival that counts. The old way is in the certain process of destruction, and a new world order is beating down the door. I fear for the little ones, the innocents, who are already paying for our mistakes. There exists a great army of occupationally orphaned children. They are attending government-controlled daycare centers. There are latchkey kids who are running wild in the streets, and the lopsided, emotionally wounded children of single welfare mothers, born only for the sake of more money in the monthly check. Open your eyes and look at them, for they are the future. In them I see the sure and certain destruction of this once proud nation. In their vacant eyes, I see the death of freedom. They carry with them a great emptiness, 
and someone will surely pay a great price for their suffering. If we do not act in concert with each other and ensure that the future becomes what we need it to be, then we will surely deserve whatever fate awaits us. I believe with all my heart that God put me in places and in positions throughout my life so that I would be able to deliver this warning to His people. I pray that I have been worthy and that I have done my job. From the time a person leaves its mother's womb, its every effort is directed toward building, maintaining, and withdrawing into artificial wombs various sorts of substitute protective devices or shells. The objective of these artificial wombs is to provide a stable environment for both stable and unstable activity, to provide a shelter for the evolutionary processes of growth and maturity, in effect, survival to provide security for freedom, and to provide defensive protection for offensive activity. This is equally true of both the general public and the elite. However, there is a definite difference in the way each of these classes go about the solution of problems. The primary reason why the individual citizens of a country create a political structure is a subconscious wish or desire to perpetuate their own dependency relationship of childhood. Simply put, they want a human God to eliminate all risk from their life, pat them on the head, kiss their bruises, put a chicken on every dinner table, clothe their bodies, tuck them into bed at night, and tell them that everything will be all right when they wake up in the morning. This public demand is incredible, so the human God, the politician, meets incredibility with incredibility by promising the world and delivering nothing. So who is the bigger liar, the public or the godfather? This public behavior is surrender born of fear, laziness, and expediency. It is the basis of the welfare state as a strategic weapon, useful against a disgusting public. Most people want to be able to subdue and or kill other human beings which disturb their daily lives, but they do not want to have to cope with the moral and religious issues which such an overt act on their part might raise. Therefore, they assign the dirty work to others, including their own children, so as to keep the blood off their own hands. They rave about the humane treatment of animals, and then sit down to a delicious hamburger from a whitewashed slaughterhouse down the street and out of sight. But even more hypocritical, they pay taxes to finance a professional association of hitmen, collectively called politicians, and then complain about corruption in government. Again, most people want to be free to do things, but they are afraid to fail. The fear of failure is manifested in irresponsibility, and especially in delegating those personal responsibilities to others where success is uncertain or carries possible or created liabilities which the person is not prepared to accept. They want authority, but they will not accept responsibility or liability, so they hire politicians to face reality for them. The people hire the politicians so that the people can, one, obtain security without managing it, two, obtain action without thinking about it, three, inflict theft, injury, and death upon others without having to contemplate either life or death, four, avoid responsibility for their own intentions, five, obtain the benefits of reality and science without exerting themselves in the discipline of facing or learning either of these things. They give the politicians the power to create and manage a war machine to, one, provide for the survival of the nation womb, two, prevent encroachment of anything upon the nation womb, three, 
destroy the enemy who threatens the nation womb, or destroy those citizens of their own country who do not conform for the sake of stability of the nation womb. Politicians hold many quasi-military jobs, the lowest being the police, which are soldiers, the attorneys and the CPAs next, who are spies and saboteurs, and the judges who shout the orders and run the closed Union military shop for whatever the market will bear. The generals are industrialists. The presidential level of commander-in-chief is shared by the international bankers. The people know that they have created this farce and financed it with their own taxes, but they would rather knuckle under than be the hypocrite. Thus a nation becomes divided into two very distinct parts, a docile subnation and a political subnation. The political subnation remains attached to the docile subnation, tolerates it, and leeches its substance until it grows strong enough to detach itself and then devour its parent. Human beings are machines levers which may be grasped and turned, and there is little real difference between automating a society and automating a shoe factory. Factor 1. As in every social system approach, stability is achieved only by understanding and accounting for human nature. A failure to do so can be, and usually is, disastrous. As in other human social schemes, one form or another of intimidation or incentive is essential to the success of the draft. Physical principles of action and reaction must be applied to both internal and external subsystems. To secure the draft, individual brainwashing, programming, and both the family unit and the peer group must be engaged and brought under control. Factor 2. Father. The man of the household must be housebroken to ensure that Junior will grow up with the right social training and attitudes. The advertising media, etc., are engaged to see to it that father-to-be is compliant before or by the time he is married. He is taught that he either conforms to the social notch cut out for him or his sex life will be hobbled and his tender companionship will be zero. He is made to see that women demand security more than logical, principled, or honorable behavior. By the time his son must go to war, father, with jelly for a backbone, will slam a gun into Junior's hand before father will risk the censure of his peers or make a hypocrite of himself by crossing the investment he has in his own personal opinion or self-esteem. Junior will go to war. Our father will be embarrassed. So Junior will go to war, the true purpose notwithstanding. Factor 3. Mother. The female element of human society is ruled by emotion first and logic second. In the battle between logic and imagination, imagination always wins. Fantasy prevails. Maternal instinct dominates so that the child comes first and the future comes second. A woman with a newborn baby is too starry-eyed to see a wealthy man's cannon fodder or a cheap source of slave labor. A woman must, however, be conditioned to accept the transition to reality when it comes or sooner. As the transition becomes more difficult to manage, the family unit must be carefully disintegrated and state-controlled public education and state-operated child care centers must become more common and legally enforced so as to begin the detachment of the child from the mother and father at an earlier age. Inoculation of behavioral drugs can speed the transition for the child. Factor 4. Junior. 
The emotional pressure for self-preservation during the time of war and the self-serving attitude of the common herd that have an option to avoid the battlefield is all of the pressure finally necessary to propel Johnny off to war. Their quiet blackmailings of him are the threats. No sacrifice, no friends, no glory, no girlfriend. Factor 5. Sister. And what about Junior's sister? She is given all the good things of life by her father and taught to expect the same from her future husband regardless of the price. Factor 6. Cattle. Those who will not use their brains are no better off than those who have no brains. And so this mindless school of jellyfish, father, mother, son, and daughter, become useful beasts of burden or trainers of the same. So now you know. You can see every step that the elite have taken in their war to control this once great nation. You can see the steps that will be taken in the future. You can no longer pretend innocence. Your denial of the conspiracy will fall on deaf ears. This tape is part of the education that will give Americans the weapons needed in the coming months and years of hardship as the New World Order struggles to be born. Truths cannot be negated or shrugged away. The message is this. You must accept that you have been cattle and the ultimate consequence of being cattle, which is slavery. Or you must prepare to fight, and if necessary, die to preserve your God-given right to freedom.